Okay, well, hey everyone, good afternoon. I am coming to you from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My name is Lisa Sharkey, and I'm Senior Vice President and Director of Creative Development at HarperCollins Publishers. Um, Megan Wilden, who is the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at BCC, um, due to the tropical storm and hurricane, her power is out, so I am going to do the introduction. And um, I just want to let you know that um, if you're not uh, familiar with OLLI, it's an incredible organization that has learning for all ages. So if you've already signed up for this talk, then you'll be getting their emails. They have an incredible selection of courses, and I'm sure you'll get a follow-up email at the end of this. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, first base, second base, and third base. That would be the Berkshire Eagle, Berkshire Gas, and Berkshire Bank for their sponsorship of these talks. They are incredible. And um, just wanted to thank Megan Wilden for all she does at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And she arranged this afternoon of baseball with no pitchers, no catchers, and no batters, no one's in the infield, no one's in the outfield, but we're in the Zoom booth with the best of the best. So um, I was first connected to Bud Selig by his agent, Sandy Montag, because I knew that upon his retirement, he would have an incredible and transformative story to tell. And his book was born out of many conversations we had at HarperCollins, and for the good of the game has become an instant classic, an instant New York Times bestseller, and for me, a project that has really brought me great personal and professional joy. Bud Selig turned 86 years young last week on July 30th on Thursday, and my father, Ed Sharkey, turned 86 the previous month, June 30th. And last year when the book came out in honor of my dad's 85th birthday, he and his longtime best friends from Brooklyn, which was of course the home site of the Brooklyn Dodgers, each one of them got a personalized copy from Bud Selig. And these young mid 80s guys who grew up watching the greats and whose love for each other and the game of baseball has never dwindled. For them, this was the ultimate book about the ultimate sport. And they started their own Bud Selig fan club book club. My dad has read the book somewhere between three and four times, and he has so much admiration for Bud that I connected the two of them on the phone recently, and they reminisced about a simpler time when masks were worn by catchers and umps, but not anyone and everyone um, trying to ward off the droplets from our global pandemic, which of course has massively impacted our entire world, not to mention America's greatest pastime. Bud dedicated his book to his mother and his father, and I know that Family means everything to the commissioner, as it does to me. And I was lucky enough to meet his wonderful daughter, Wendy, when we launched the first edition of the book last summer. Um, you know, baseball has played a really big role in my life as a parent of two sons who both played baseball all the way up to the NCAA, all the way through college in St. Louis, Missouri. And Bud's life changed when he was in college. He was a freshman. Um, and when Major League Baseball moved the Boston Braves, um, to Milwaukee in 1953, Bud was a freshman at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, which was a mere 80 miles away, which really wasn't that far a drive for a young kid who really wanted to watch some great baseball. And my very own nephew, Charlie Goldstein, is going to be a freshman at that very same school, and Bud is still teaching there now. He takes a class on baseball from 1945 to the present. And we are going to have a course right now as the Berkshire Eagles' own longtime sports writer, Howard Herman, who's been at the paper since 1987 and on the sports beat since 91, covering the Mets, not the one that my husband is constantly frustrated by, you know, because he's from Queens, but the Pittsfield Mets, um, the ones that our family went to see play every summer during my son's entire childhood because they love to visit Grammy and Pop in the Berkshires. Pop being my stepdad, Art Sherman, who is highly involved with Osher Lifelong Learning. And he's really helped to bring um, Ollie into the forefront. And these talks with the Berkshire Eagle have just been incredible. Berkshire Eagle really, from a journalistic perspective, pitches it right over the plate. Um, they were a, a thriving paper that sort of was on the down and out. And then they got brought, bought um, and they've really been, you know, it, it's a hard time for newspapers all over. So if you want to support a local paper, please support the absolutely wonderful Berkshire Eagle. 
And speaking of legendary and papers, I just want to turn it over right now to Howard and Bud Selig for a thought-provoking conversation. If you have questions, I will moderate after these guys are done and you can put them in your message. And hopefully, maybe I'll get a chance to ask um, the commissioner one of your questions. So take it away, Howard. Take it away, commissioner. And thank you all for joining. Thanks, Lisa, very much. I'm Howard Herman. I'm, as Lisa said, I'm a sports writer and a columnist at Berkshire Eagle. Everybody here at the Eagle, we're all happy to team up with the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College to bring you this Eagle conversation with Bud Seeley. And we are grateful to Berkshire Bank for its continuous support of the conversation, Eagle Conversation Series. So we thank them, Ollie, HarperCollins, and Berkshire Gas uh, for bringing this together. So with that out of the way, uh, Bud Seeley, the Commissioner Emeritus of Baseball, welcome. Commissioner Seeley, great to see you there. How are you today? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Nice to see you. I know we're a little frustrated here, but we're, we got through now, so that's good. Ah, it's technology. Sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, if, if it, things were technical, you just kind of like slapped the side of the TV in it and it fixed it. Wanted to start, you know, I, when I read the book, I noticed you jump right in to the, to the right. Barry Bonds home run chase story. But I was, wanted, before it, we get to all of that, kind of wanted to go in chronological order. And I wanted you to talk to us about your first trip to Wrigley Field in 1947, what that was like. Well, the, the first trip to Wrigley Field was actually in 1945. Okay. Um, and I was um, 10 years old, 11 years old, actually. And I'll never forget it. I had an uncle who my dad had brought me down to Chicago, and my uncle, who was a tailor, took me to Wrigley Field. It was really exciting because, you know, all I had done is listen to Cub games on the radio. And so here I am in Wrigley Field. And, 1947 was interesting because I was in Chicago. There's a long story. And the great Jackie Robinson's first game in Wrigley Field. And I went with a friend of mine, Herb Cole, who later became a senator and the owner of the Bucks, and a lifelong friend of mine. And my dad called a cousin of mine who was a professor at the University of Chicago and said, you got to meet the boys. And I remember we were 12, 13 years old. And the uh, place was jammed. We were in the upper deck, and I'll never forget looking around. And it just dawned on me as a 13-year-old that we were the only white people in the, in the upper deck. It was terribly exciting. Of course, I became a great fan of Jackie Robinson's to this day. And that was my trip to Wrigley Field, Chicago, and it was quite a day. Thousands of people outside. The excitement that Jackie created was really quite unbelievable. Yeah, because when I, as I read this in the book, it made me think about my very first baseball memory, which was in Pittsburgh in 1961 when my mother and one of my aunts took me, my sister, and a couple of my cousins. It was opening day, and it snowed. They were, hang, they, they were raising the world championship banner from the 1960 World Series. And right. That's my first big memory of baseball, which is which made me think of in the book how your mom was really critical in your in your love of, in your love of baseball. And I know, and there was and uh, there's a story about your six week trip to the East Coast. Yeah, so my mother was. You know, my mother was a school teacher. Um, school teacher to to the end as she was, but she loved baseball. And I remember as a kid, oh, uh, maybe five, six years old, my mother would be listening to the ball game. She'd either listen to the Brewers, who were the American Association AAA club, or the Chicago Cubs. And because, you know, we're only 90 miles away. And she listened to games voraciously. And I, as a result, I became a real baseball fan. And it was my mother all through the years. My dad liked it because it was a way to spend time with me and my brother. But my mother was really, I have to give her credit, was the one that really made me a baseball fan. And um, uh, not unusual when you run a baseball team and understand how women 
really are such a crucial part of, of the thing. But I must say, my mother, right almost to the end, was fan. We got a team, and she never missed a game. She'd sit in the box next to mine. I'd have to clean up my language and do some other things, the result, which I often didn't. But um, but boy, she lived and died with it. But that's the way she was. I'll tell you a funny story, if I may. In 1956, I'm graduating from the University of Wisconsin, and I'm the president of our fraternity, and we're having a big luncheon in the spring. And I'm up at the dais and speaking. My mother's in the audience. I can still close my eyes and see it in the front row, listening to the game on a transistor radio. That's 1956. And all of a sudden here, as we're going along, and it's quite a wonderful luncheon, and this voice says, Buddy, Joe Adcock just hit a grand slam home run in Ebbets Field. The Braves are winning. And, and of course, everybody in the audience uh, laughed and cheered. So she was a real fan. And uh, many have commented on my love and passion for the game. And I, but I have to give my mother great credit for that. My dad, too, but certainly my mother. I wrote a story advancing the talk and was speaking with a baseball owner whose family is part of the Yankees ownership group. And you were praised for being a baseball fan. Did how many of how much of your tenure as commissioner were your decisions guided obviously by the best interests of the game, but by the fact that you grew up a fan? Well, I, I could never, nor did I try to hide my great love and passion and everybody who had known me. Remember, I'd been an owner and today, a lot of these people had known me a long time and there's no question. Uh, I'll go home tonight uh, after this and I'll watch, well, 14 games, I guess one or two, I'm not going to be played. But, um, but the fact of the matter is that um, uh, I did have a passion and do have a passion for the game. And I think it helped me. Look, the best interest clause ruled my life as well it should. But I really believe to be a success, you've got to have a passion and a real love for something. And I did for baseball. And um, whoever you talked to, I think, read me absolutely correct. There's discussion in the book. You talked about um, when the Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee in 1953. And then 12 years later, they moved to Atlanta. That's an awfully short period. What was it like for you as a fan for them to come? And then I know you were part of the um, organized groups that were trying to either keep the Braves in, a, in, in Milwaukee or replace them. How, how traumatic of a time was that? Well, it was. When they came, I'll never forget, we drove in from Madison, Herb Cole and me, we stood on what's called Story Parkway above County Stadium. There's this beautiful new red brick stadium going up. And to think of all the years that I'd gone to Chicago and we had gone and listened to White Sox games and Cub games and other games. Milwaukee was in the big leagues. You have no idea the excitement. And for the first six, seven, eight years, it was unbelievable. And now in 1964 and five, the Braves are trying to leave to go to Atlanta. Heartbreaking, really heartbreaking. Taught me a lesson that I never forgot, by the way. And um, uh, they left. They stayed here an extra year because they had to. And we sort of ran. We Teams Incorporated, which is a local group, became the Brewers. But I'll never forget the heartache. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. So last game in 1965, the Milwaukee Braves are playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. The great Koufax is pitching for L.A. And, of course, we have the likes of Hank Aaron and Eddie Matthews. Really have a wonderful team. And the, the Dodgers won the game, but the Braves really hit Koufax, which was amazing. But a woman came up to me. It's a story that I, I used to tell the club owner. And she said, are you Bud Selig? And I know the people with me said, oh. I said, I am. And she said, you know, this is breaking my heart. And she was weeping. And she said, do you know how much this means to us? Do you know what this is doing to people like me? And then she pointed her finger at me and said, don't you fail. You're all we got. And I never forgot 
did that help you during your time as commissioner to try to keep teams where they were? Because under your watch, the only team that actually moved from one place to another was Montreal moving to Washington. At the very beginning of your tenure, the Giants had made noises about moving to Tampa. There had been talk over the years that if a new stadium couldn't be built in my hometown in Pittsburgh, the Pirates might move elsewhere. Did that did that experience with Milwaukee and Atlanta help you, you know, help you try to keep teams where they were? Yes, it did. No question about it. That's the thing. And I always, as time went on, I know in 1971, my second year in baseball, we moved the Washington Senators to Dallas, but not until after an all-day thing where we fought to keep a team in Washington. And it was finally Mr. Fetzer and Tom Yawkey convinced me, Mr. Fetzer being my mentor and the owner of the Tigers, that, look, we have no choice. We can't find an owner. But outside of Montreal, which we can talk about, and I know there are people in Montreal who are unhappy, but I kept it there three extra years. We couldn't find an ownership group, and we and we had a stadium that you couldn't play baseball in. And by the way, they still don't. And so that was the only team that moved, and it, it turned out it's turned out well. Washington, of course, now the world champions. But yes, there's no question about it. Baseball, you will hear me say, and the clubs heard me say, and in the book you is a social institution, and it has great responsibility. That's true whether it's drug testing, that's true. But the fact of the matter is that the interesting part of that is that you have a responsibility. Look at the Giants, kept them there. They built this magnificent ballpark, won three world championships. So outside of Montreal, and I really didn't want to do that, but we did because we were left with no alternative. The Milwaukee experience profoundly made my thinking on that subject, that don't move if you don't have to. Before we get back to talking about things in the book, um, there's discussion right now that at some point, Tampa Bay may split a season with Montreal. What do you think of that idea? Well, I'm going to have to let them work all that out. I um, I like Montreal, by the way. I really do. Uh, uh, Charles Bronfman, who owned the, the Expos, was one of the great owners in baseball and remains a great friend of mine to this day, who I have awesome respect for. And I think with the right ownership and that, I think Montreal could be a really good franchise. Whether Tampa and Montreal, whether that can work out, that's before the owners now, and they've got a lot of work to do on that subject, I would say, a lot of work. In your book, you jump right into it with both feet, talking about um, the Barry Bonds chase um, for the home run record. Um, when you think back on it now, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, that was a difficult period. I'm proud of what we did. I want to get into the whole steroid thing and the whole drug testing program. And many have misunderstood. Hank Aaron has been one of my closest friends since 1958. And many thought that I reacted a lot because of my friendship with Henry. But Henry was very understanding. And look, I believe that baseball is a social institution. You, you already heard me say it a couple of times. And I think all of us have an obligation to that. And I felt during the steroid thing, remember, baseball never had a drug testing program. Let me say this at the outset. Today, and with Rob Manfred's help and Dan Hallam and a lot of people, we have the toughest testing program, not only in sports, but in America. And so I'm proud of the fact that we did what we people are critical about. Well, you, you didn't react. Remember, it's a subject of collective bargaining. The union fought us. They wouldn't deny it to their everlasting credit. They fought us, and they fought us hard. But we started in 02, started actually before that. And by the time I left in, in 15 and today, we have a test, testing program that, that, that's 
second to none. And so we came a long way, but it was painful. And I started with the, with the Barry Bonds thing because it was a very difficult period and he was difficult throughout that. But it, it was because of my social institution theory, not because of my friendship with the great Henry Allen. In, in chapter 20, you wrote, in the end, it didn't matter who was at fault. Our image suffered. We paid a terribly high price. As you think back on it now, was there much you could have done differently? No. You know, I've thought a lot about that. I've thought a lot about it. And we, uh, we were, look, in 98, when I started, we had no drug testing program, even in the cocaine era of the 80s. Think about that. Even with the cocaine era of the 80s, we couldn't get a drug testing program. Four guys in the Pittsburgh drug trials went to jail. 29 were, were, were indicted. It was a really difficult situation. And so when I look back, look, we fought. We fought. Uh, Murray Chass of the New York Times used to call me the evangelist because all I did is preach about drug testing. But the union fought it, and they didn't believe in it. Marvin Miller, when he died, said if he were still head of the union, nobody would be peeing in a bottle. And it, so it was a really tough negotiation. But is there anything different? I, I, people keep asking me that. Could you have done more? Look, nobody had gotten a drug testing program before I got in office. And, and so it really was a very, very painful, tough situation. I can't second guess it, and I'm proud of where we are now. I really am because, um, you know, people talked about steroids, and none of us even knew what they were. And, and I've talked to a lot of great executives, uh, uh, including some in the Hall of Fame, and uh, about it. And they, there was just nothing more that we could really do. But... Somebody said I could have yelled louder. Well, I yelled every day, and they got tired of hearing about it. So important thing was we now have it. It's done. It gets tougher every year. Much of the credit should go to Rob Manfred and other people, and so I'm very pleased. You write in the book that baseball was caught off guard when McGuire and Sosa, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa passed Roger Maris in the single season record. Right. But and Bonds was almost a decade later. When you think about the time between the two major incidents, do you have any different kind of different impressions of the players then versus versus what happened since? No, a McGuire Sosa thing, and you know, I'm a I happen to like both of them. I really happen to like both of them. Uh, Mark has made his peace with baseball. Sammy hasn't yet. Um, people say, well, it's say baseball. No, it didn't. It was a good, it was exciting for that year. Nobody's questioned it. But the more we got into steroids and the more I saw, which is why, by the way, I hired Senator Mitchell later on. To, first time uh, you that you know that anybody um, ever went outside their sport, uh, any commissioner to hire some, I had George Mitchell come in, who was a friend of mine. And great man, great statesman, and he really did a lot of work and investigated it. And in fact, made 20 recommendations. We accepted every one of them. And today, the clubhouses and everything about is a result of, uh, of really, really, I'm proud of what we did. In your book, um, you quote the uh former Commissioner Bowie Kuhn is saying, we're always held to a higher standard. Baseball always somehow gets held to a higher standard. It's a compliment, except when you're a commissioner, then it makes life tougher. Is that why the, the issue of performance-enhancing substances resonates so much in your game compared to other sports? I don't know about that, but I'll tell you a story about how that happened. I'm, I'm a young owner, 1971, and Bowie asked me to come to New York, and I go... He and I go to lunch, and he says, on the way over, I said to him, boy, was getting killed and subject, and we bump into Pete Rozell, of all people. And on the very subject, Pete Rozell is being 
hailed and patted on the back. And it, so it's Bowie and Pete and I, and I'm thrilled, sitting in between the two commissions. And on the way back, I said, this is not fair. You're getting killed. Pete Rozelle is getting patted on the back. And he looked at me and he said, buddy, don't ever forget this. We're held to a higher and tougher standard. And you ought to be complimented. Yes, it's very tough to live when you're the commissioner. I never dreamed at that point that I was going to be the commissioner. But he was right. And we are held to our, and we should be. And we should be proud of that. Is that why when football players get caught and other uh, using PEDs, all their fans want to know is when are they coming back? And when a baseball player gets caught, fans want them banned. Well, I think that's right. You know, um, Paul Horning, who played for my Packers, great player, and Alex Karras, a great defensive lineman of the Detroit Lions, they got... Um, they were gambling, got thrown out of football for a year, came back, wound up in the Hall of Fame. And, and of course, Pete Rose in the same situation. Look, we have integrity. We have a rule since 1920. The, the office was created because of the Black Sox. Scandal. And what it says is, look, you're, 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 if you gamble on a baseball game, when you're in baseball, you're suspended. For life. We all grew up with that rule. By the way, it's the most important thing is because if you have don't have integrity, you have nothing left. You have absolutely nothing left. And so um, when um, Peter Ubroff and then uh, Faye Vincent and then Bruce Barciamati, whom I love, um, made the decision on Rose, they made the correct decision. So um, football had, I guess, a little different view, but, but, but I, one thing I've told the clubs, and I would say to you, without integrity, you don't have a sport, and you can't take any chances. You mentioned uh, a, a gentleman's name a little bit earlier, Marvin Miller. It feels to me like he should be enshrined in Cooperstown. What's your feeling on that? Well, I'm, he is going to be entrained. He was elected this year. And I said, much to the consternation of some of my associates, that, uh, but I believe that. Look, in Marvin's case, while Marvin and I didn't agree on much, getting into Cooperstown, as I found out myself, is what kind of impact did you make on baseball and did you have on baseball? And Marvin had have a great impact. So... Although he's gone, I'm glad that he was elected to the Hall of Fame. And do I think it was right? Yes, I do. What was his impact? Well, changed the economics of the game, including free agency. I mean, there are a lot of impacts Marvin had, some of which were good and some of which I didn't agree with. But he, certainly he created free agency and created other things. And in the end... Um, he gave the players a lot of freedom. And so, look, as I said, I, I could quarrel with a lot of things Marvin did, but Marvin had a great impact on the game, and he was properly elected to the Hall of Fame. You own the Milwaukee Brewers for an awful long time. Um, one of their one of the Brewers' most famous GMs, obviously, Harry Dalton, who hired another Amherst College guy from an area in, um, in Berkshire County, Dan Duquette. Just, That's right. What, just talk to me to us a bit about both of them. Well, I loved Harry, um, and I liked Dan Duquette a lot. Um, Harry Dalton was a really great executive. I got him in 1977 for the 78 season, and he was here 15, now yeah, more than that, 16 years. Great general manager. We had a lot of success. Very smart, very articulate. I believe really you could make a compelling case that Harry should be considered for the Hall of Fame. Um, but he was here. He had great success in Baltimore. He had great success in uh, on the West Coast. And he had really great success in Milwaukee. Very smart, very articulate, and a pleasure to be around. Dan Duquette, I remember, as a young kid. Harry hired another Amherst kid. And... Um, 
So Dan and I oftentimes would be the last guy left after a night game. I'd be working. Dan would be working. Duke, as I called him. And um, and so we established a great relationship to this day. And uh, Duke turned out to be a really good executive. He had some tough times. But one thing about having a career in baseball, you're going to have good times. You're going to have them bad times. In fact, I remember talking to um, one of his, a member of his family who had been the interim general manager of the Mets, and they took the tag off, and I asked him about that, and he said, we are all interim in this business anyway. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. That is true. That is true. In other sports, there are salary caps, and on page 124 of your book, uh, you write about the widening gap in revenues between franchises. This has been an uh, invitation for a majority of the teams uh, um, over the previous decade, and you haven't been able to do Should baseball have a salary cap? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I lived with that for 50 years. The 94-95 strike, which cost us the World Series, was over a cap. And I can remember Stan Kasten, who at that time was president of the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Hawks, saying to me, we're not asking for half as much as the other sports have already. And he was right. He was right. But I, I guess what I would say to you about that is I think we've learned to live without it. And I think, you know, the cap, there are things I love about the cap. But I think the game has gone on. We've had some had some huge years, and and I think for the most part we learned to live without it. But would I like would I have liked the cap? Yes, I would have. But it caused one labor uh, disruption, and we weren't we just weren't ready to have another. In your tenure as commissioner, you developed you got teams to start interleague play. How difficult was that? to to establish and did it happen was it easier than we thought it might have been or was it more were there more discussions about interleague play before it happened uh, i loved it i had heard uh, hank greenberg and bill beck talk about it when i was a kid and i loved it and i love it to this day because it gives your fans a chance to see all the players just like the wild card when i did the wild card oh there was a lot of criticism oh you can't do that and they can't do that and the wild card has turned out to be phenomenal. So uh, that we've increased the number of wild card teams and they may do it again. So um, it was difficult because baseball fights change. Social institutions are, are generally reluctant to change. And so overall, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm thrilled with all the changes. They made the game a better game. They made the game... We became far more sensitive to our fans. And you asked before at the beginning whether I was a fan. Yeah, I was. And I think I, be, I really understood what a fan thinks and why. The wild card, was it easy once you had the wild card to get that second wild card and then have a wild card game before oh, you Oh, that's an interesting question. I had a 14-person committee, great four GMs, four managers, four owners and uh, uh, George Will and Frank Robinson. And that was one of the things we discussed. And, you know, they were more for it than I was. But it worked. And the wild card just generally has worked out even better than I thought. We passed it in September of 1993 in Boston. I knew it was good, but I didn't think it was this good. If we can uh, seg off of other topics in your book should should they be playing baseball right now all things considered yes oh i feel very strongly about it absolutely look i said to you before we're a social institution the country is ready by the way our television ratings have been remarkable people are happy i'm like a little kid at home i turn on a ball game and so our ratings have been good um you know, I have a letter in my office, being a history book, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt wrote to Kennesaw Mountain Landis in 1942, saying baseball should be played during the Second World War because it'll give people something to do. Well, the same thing is true here. Um, and I know people have been a little critical about, uh, you know, we have, yes, the Marlins had a problem. They're going to play again tonight. 
the Phillies are back playing. Um, the Yankees, of course, really didn't miss any games. So other than that, um, I know the Milwaukee Club didn't play over the weekend. They're the Cardinals, and they won't play for a while. But other than that, there's 12 or 13 games going on every night. And they're good, and the players are enjoying it. We're a social institution. And if we can do things like this, it's like my debate after 9-11, when to come back, how to come back. And you can never forget that the social institution responsibilities are good. You bring up 9-11. I remember all of what happened in your game vividly. Can you just talk for a couple of minutes about how difficult it was to decide when to come back and yeah one of the most painful weeks i it was horrible the whole thing was horrible and we sat for three or four days i talked to everybody including the president of the united states multiple times and they were all wondering and everybody said to me in the end commissioner come back when you think it's right and that's what you talked about now and that's what i tried to do then when will it help? When will there be a catharsis here that will really help? I finally decided on a Monday, six days. And um, I remember coming home that night, and I had my little granddaughter, I have five granddaughters, but one of them, Marissa, my, was up there with me, and I'm watching. And I'm flipping around, and I come to the Cardinals and the Brewers, pregame show. There's the great Jack Buck out on the field. And he's reading from a piece of cardboard, and he says, should we be here tonight? With that, the crowd rises, standing ovation. And it was just wonderful. And I cried. My granddaughter couldn't figure out why I was crying. But, and I called Joe Buck the next day, and I, then I talked to Jack, and he sent me the cardboard. I have it in my office. He had written that. And, and when he said, should we be here, and Piazza had a home run that night in New York, and and I remember the World Series and the pain of all that, but President Bush walking out to the mound and the crowd chanting USA. It's one of the great nights that I've ever been in. in, in most tensest night I've ever been in a ballpark. So that's how I've evolved my social uh, institution theory. Because you watch it and things like that and you say, boy, this is really good. And, of course, uh, President Bush, former owner of the Texas Rangers. Right. And one, and one of the biggest baseball fans that's been in the White House in an awful long time. I got to think that um, his ownership of the Rangers prior to his going to the White House helped a lot when you guys talked to each other about, you know, getting back and when baseball should resume. Absolutely. Talked to him a lot. And he was very helpful. And he was that, and I'm... Proud to say right behind me here uh, is a letter from him when I got in the Hall of Fame and also when I retired. And uh, President Bush is really not only a great baseball fan, but uh, whether you agreed with him politically or not, a really good human being. And you wrote in your book that he would have made a good commissioner. He would have. He had a great passion for the game. He understood the game. There's no question about it. But he chose a different route. He chose governor of Texas and then president of the United States. Getting back to today's game, are you in favor of, do you like what Major League Baseball did with some of the rule changes for, for 2020? And we'll start with one that isn't just for 2020, but the designated here going to the National League. Yeah, I'm the only one left who voted. I was in the American League in 1972 when it went to, uh, uh, sat in New York, and I'm the only person left in that room who's, Voted for it and it worked out well, but I like both. But I, I look, this is an unusual year for trying to get through a very difficult year, and I think this is a year to try changes. So whether I like them or not, I'm I'm delighted on the DH, and even the tenth inning rule, which which I know uh, is, is somewhat great. at least it's an experiment now, and this is the kind of year to experiment. So that's my answer. Have you seen the 10th inning um, rule activated in a game that you have watched? And did it surprise you at all 
that it's gone maybe uh, that people like it more than we than many traditional yeah they have i've seen it i've seen it in a couple of brewer games i've seen it in a couple of other games and you know while i wasn't crazy about it the more i watch it given the fact that you know they are trying to keep us from having 15 or 16 or 17 inning games um i've liked it more than i thought i would but as i said this is a year for change You, you, you briefly talked before about how the television ratings have been up. I got to think that it's some of it is that people are just looking for live live events. But I, it feels to me like you know that people have especially been waiting for your game to come back. I think that's true, and it gets back. And I said to you, you're going to get tired of my social institution theory, but I think that's true. I, it's I, I had. Uh, I had somebody stop me on the street the other day and say, it just feels normal again to be able to watch a ball game. And that made me feel good. And so I, I know people complain, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for the little interruptions we've had relative to the Marlins and the other, but for the most part, it's gone well. And there's a feeling, I, I think if baseball didn't come back and, didn't play at all this year. It would have been harmful to the game, but not good for the country because it's giving people something to do. You talk a little bit, a little bit in the book about some of the ownership changes, and if you could just go back over for us how John Henry ended up with the Red Sox. Well, that was a curious one. John Henry bought the Florida Marlins, and soon he was not happy there. The Red Sox were being sold. John Harrington represented the Iraqi Foundation. Great man, by the way. One of the finest people I've ever known. And um, there was some controversy because John Henry wasn't from Boston. And so I took a pounding. But he had, John, he had Tom Werner and he had Larry Lucchino. And Larry had been very successful in Baltimore, in San Diego. And Tom Werner had, had been on. And this was a good group. And they've bought the Red Sox. They've preserved Fenway Park. They've won four world championships. Um, I know they were second guessing me at the time. Looks pretty good 50, 18 years later. How good does it make you feel that not only have they done well, but what they've done at Fenway Park instead of building it and you know, instead of building a new park adjacent that they were able to do what they have done at it may, the, it, the it, legendary it, ballparks. You have no idea. It's like, it's like I, how I feel about the Ricketts family in Chicago. They preserved what I call our two cathedrals, and that's terribly important. And so uh, John Henry, uh, Larry Lucchino, Tommy Werner, Tom Ricketts, they, they're two of the most famous stadiums, but they mean so much to those cities and to this game. And he preserved them and won. And so overall, um, I guess in the, what I like to call the retrospective history, you know, commissioners can always be second guessed, but I'm happy with those. Well, on, in your tenure as commissioner, you also helped shepherd a new era of tremendous facilities from PNC Park in Pittsburgh, you mentioned, um, the park in San Francisco, but so, but instead of those um, circular cookie cutter, Three River Stadium, Veteran Stadium, Bush Stadium in Chicago, every the parks now have their own personalities. How how much do you feel that that has helped the game grow? Well, you know, we've set attendance records. We've done things a lot. You know, we were talking. When I was a kid growing up at Wrigley Field, you'd remember Forbes Field, you got Evans Field in Brooklyn, the Polo Grounds in New York. These, these parks became synonymous with the city. And they were unique. Then we had, as you call them, the cookie cutter. They were a disaster. I used to joke you could fall asleep, maybe had too much to drink. You could wake up in Philly, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. They all looked the same. They had no character. They had nothing. I think the ballparks I, that we got built 22, 23, 
distinctive or have played a huge role in the comeback of this sport. Huge role. It would be un might be unfair of me to ask the question this way, but as a as a as a parent like that, do you have a favorite of the new ones? Well, uh, are they like are they like all your children and they're all good? Well, that's right, that's right. And as the commissioner, I said, but there's some great ballparks. I love Miller Park. Here, I'll tell you, PNC Park in Pittsburgh is really a terrific park. But there's a lot of them I really like. I do. I, I even the new Yankee Stadium. You know, I. I there's so much history there. They preserved a lot of history. So I'll always go back to Fenway Park and Wrigley Field, but there are a lot of the new ballparks are really wonderful. Atlanta's new ballpark. I mean, I could go on and on and on. When you look at the state of the game right now, you see the players, you see what, what, what players do and all that. How healthy is the on-the-field sport right now? Um. I think we're lucky. I think we have a new wave of great young players, by the way, that are really, really good. I think I, I think people sometimes don't understand. So I feel really good about the, the new players. You look at Mike Trout. Mike Trout's statistics stunningly are better than DiMaggio, Williams, Musio, Mantle. I mean, they're just really remarkable. So I... I I think the game is very healthy. I know we've been through some problems, but we'll work our way through those problems. That's why it's so important for it to be bad. And when people say to me, oh, but look at this and that, but they never talk about the 27 or 28 teams that are doing fine that don't have those problems. And as I said, you look at Cody Bellinger in L.A., Christian Yelich here in Milwaukee, Mike Trout, oh, they're, they're just... You, there's so many wonderful young players all over the place. Your relationship, you mentioned it in the book a lot, your relationship with Hank Aaron, an extremely special one. Just um, tell us, how special, of a, is he a better guy than a baseball player? Well, that's a really interesting question. I, You know, he was a great player. I'm partial, and I know that, but I think he was the greatest player of my generation. I know that a lot of people think, well, he may, and that's certainly, I understand that. Henry Aaron is one of the finest human beings I've ever known. And he's never changed. Broke Babe Ruth's record. Great and unfortunately took a pounding from a lot of races. But I can't tell you he's the same thoughtful human being that I met in 1958. And um, I, I can't tell you how much I think of him as a person. Yes, he was a great player, one of the great players of all time. But he's a better human being. Lisa, I imagine there are a ton of people out there with questions, so I'll, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Bud. Um, I just want to remind people before we go to the audience questions that for the good of the game, it's now out in paperback. You can see right here, New York Times bestseller, the commissioner and I, we're really excited to see the book hit the bestseller list. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, my dad uh, has read it about four times. Uh, it's an amazing book. Um, we have a question now from Pamela Antoine. Um, she's, you know, you spoke a lot, but about your mother's influence on you and the love of baseball. And she would like to know uh, what you think about the important role that women play in baseball and in this uh, important sport. They do, they, and I really mean this, and they play a really crucial role. Um, I had, as I say, as you know, you know my, the influence of my mother, so, but I, the one thing that I have, all, all the years I ran a team and I was commissioner, women make up a huge percentage of our fans, and it, they take to baseball for whatever the reason. I have all kinds of sociological theories about that, but really crucial. And I know the follow-up question, will there ever be a, I mean, we have a lot of women in baseball in executive positions. My daughter ran the Brewers for years. And so we're making great progress on that score. And someday there'll be, a, there'll be a woman play baseball. I'm not sure I'll live to see it, but I certainly wouldn't say there won't be because there will be. Um, this is a provocative question from Mitzi Saul, and she wants to know, did you ever encounter anti-Semitism as an owner and a commissioner? 
No, that's quite an interesting question. I guess I was really fortunate um, because I, I really didn't, either as an owner or even before, I was lucky. And I and I thought a lot about that. That's a great question. And I didn't, uh, as a commissioner, I really never ran into anti-Semitism. There may have been some things that I wasn't aware of, but it certainly did, impede, it did not impede my career at any time. Um, Jessica Caitlin is asking if you have any advice for somebody looking to get into the business of baseball. I do. Get the best education you can. I'm a professor now, so this is what I tell students, but I get the best education you can and then have patience. You got to we have great intern programs in baseball. We have great intern programs at the club level. They're really good. And a lot of people take go from there and, and, and go. And so I, I would tell you that if you're really interested, and I, and I want the one thing I do want to see is women play a far more prominent role in, in, the, in the running of clubs. And uh, we're, I think we're well on the way to doing that. But have patience and keep, keep at it. Um, Paul Gluck wants to know, as commissioner, which accomplishment are you most proud of? What was your greatest disappointment as well? He'd like both sides of that. Uh, I guess the greatest disappointment was back in 94 and 95 when we lost the World Series and had a lot of labor problems. I'm proud of the fact and then for the next 27 or 8 years, we had labor peace. Um, but that, that was really painful and very difficult. I... I I'm proud of a lot of things, you know, retiring Jackie's number, uh, the wild card that we've talked about, about the, but changing the economic structure of the game, which had never been changed, is a thing I'll always be proud of. So, and I, uh, David Glass, who owned the Kansas City Royals, and unfortunately passed away, used to say to me on multiple occasions, you don't make those changes. A lot of these clubs and small markets are out of business. That's the thing I'm proud of. Stuff. Um, so here's a question from my dad who was listening in from Texas. Um, he wants to know, when do you feel that Major League Baseball, or do you feel it'll start to expand both to Asia, Japan, and Korea? And do you think that there's some way that the tension that we have with the foreign countries could be broken by baseball expanding and uh, us playing against players? Well, it gets to my social institution theory because we've opened up in Japan and we've done so much. Um, we're going to expand, uh, to expand into, you know, my, my dream is to have a real World Series. Someday have the team that wins here play the best team in the world, maybe in Japan now. Um, we're ways away from that yet. And airline travel is going to have to be because there's just no way you can fit into a season now. But someday I think that will happen. And do I believe again that it can serve uh, as a proper institute. I do. I do very much. Um, Neil Binstock wants to know, in your opinion, what was the greatest World Series game ever and what was the runner-up? Oh, that's tough. Uh, there have been so many great World Series games, but I'll go back to the 01 World Series because of everything that had happened. And um, every game that decided in New York in the ninth inning, and then the, the game seven of the 01 World Series, uh, on, uh, Luis Gonzalez got a base hit off of Mariano Rivera. And given everything the world was going through, that was a great one. But there have been so many really great World Series. I, I, it, and, you know, it, um, it, it fascinates. That's a fascinating question because. Probably a half hour from now, I'll have about 10 other World Series games I want. But I, I'm going to go with the 01 World Series for the time being. All right. Well, maybe you can do a follow-up book and you can write about the greatest World Series games ever. That would be a good thing. You know, think about 04 when the Yankees in the playoffs were down, old, uh, the Red Sox, and they won. They beat the Yankees. And then won in the ghost of Bambino and the curse of Bambino was lifted and the Red Sox were world champions. And I can still remember. The last out was a bouncing ball back to Keith Folk, the Red Sox pitcher, and he threw the first. I thought to myself, boy, this is something. And about a week or two later, I was in Boston. I'm walking down the street, and some of the Red Sox would 
uh, Larry Aquino and John Henry and, and Tom Werner, and a guy stops me, commissioner. Do you know how much that meant to me? I went to the, and he was serious. I went to the cemetery to say to tell my mom and dad, we won it. We finally won it. And he started crying. Um, Bob Warwick wants to, and this, this is an interesting question. How do you believe the often post midnight end of the world series games affect the popularity of baseball as a spectator sport, especially to younger fans? Why aren't the world series games, especially on weekends played as day games, or at least with earlier starting times, is there a fear that they can't compete with the NFL? Yeah, no, that's an off asked question. Let me tell you about ratings. The ratings get better as the games go on. We do put a lot of playoff games during the day, and we'll have some this year. They're just, the ratings are terrible. And yet, the longer a game goes at night, the better the rating gets. And the all of our broadcast partners, particularly fine, have stuff on Saturday and Sunday afternoons football. They just can't put the game on. But we do start early, and um, I... I I just, it would be hard for me, as it was then, and I'm sure it is for Rob Manfred, to say to, an, uh, to a network, well, you got to put them on at 3 o'clock when the rating isn't one half of what it is later on. Right, it's not prime time, and that's where the right. commercial buys are, and, you know, obviously, it's a business. Um, Allison Coley is asking, she says, this year's Hall of Fame induction ceremonies were canceled due to the pandemic, obviously. Are the inductees right now in the hall despite no ceremonies? Yes. Oh, yes. that's great. Yes, they're in the hall. And, uh, and you know, we'll have it next year. All these, including Ted Simmons, who was a Milwaukee catcher, St. Louis catcher, Milwaukee catcher. But they'll all be, plus Derek Jeter, who would have gone in this year, who would draw a huge crowd. So hopefully by next July, we'll be ready to have the Hall of Fame. Um, what do you think about downsizing of the minors, uh, Randy Wynn would like to know? Well, I know that uh, baseball and, and Rob has done a lot of work on that subject. I, 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 I love the minor league people and I love the minor leagues, but everything in life changes and I think they're doing what they think is in the best interest of the game. Um, and, you know, I think it's important for people to know, um, you know, what you people are a lot of people are talking about Pete Rose. They want to, everyone wants to ask you about Pete Rose. So do you no. have it? you want to say about Pete Rose? Well, I do. And look, I am um, when Bart Giamatti, whom I dearly loved before he died, suspended Pete, he said that Pete could make application to come back, but he had to reconstruct his life. I said before that my office was created by the Black Sox scandal, which almost killed baseball. Babe Ruth actually brought baseball back. And so you can't, you know, integrity and honesty are not flexible. And here's Pete Rose gambling on the game while he was a manager of the Cincinnati Reds. That's just not permissible. And so I understand he was a great player. He was a great player. Oh, thank you. But I believe that Peter Ubroff and Bart Giamatti had it right, and everybody since then, including me, has it right. It was, as Bart said, a stain on baseball, and that's what it is. Now, here's a great question from Jack McKenna. How is it possible that the decision was not made to strip the World Series title from the Houston Astros for cheating? Well, that's a decision that, uh, and I understand it. I, I'm I actually... It's very difficult once something is over to start stripping things. You can discipline them. You can do a lot of things. And I think Rob Manfred has done extremely well on that score. But, um, and I know the Houston situation is a sad one. But trying to change things, just like people wanted me to take home run crowns away from people. And you, just, that's really quite difficult to do. You're really on a slippery slope. So, I, I, I agree with Rob's decision. I do. That doesn't mean I, I'm happy with what Houston did. Okay. Uh, I think we've really gotten a, a lot of your time. I know that you've extended it um, for us. And I just want to reiterate what an honor and a pleasure it was for me personally and professionally to be working with you on your memoir. Um, you're just an incredible person. And uh, as, as my dad always says, I wish 
Bud Selig could be president of the United States. <laughs> well, he's very nice, and I look at I've enjoyed a relationship. You know, this book that we've talked about, and you know, you there with me. Um, took me a long time and went through a lot of things. But when I was all done, I really glad that I've done it. And I really am happy you've done it. And it was great working with you. And um, this has been fun. I've enjoyed this. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to throw it back um, to Howard or Megan. And uh, just, you know, go out and get the book. Here it is one more time for the good of the game. And it's got a forward by Doris Kearns Goodwin. So, uh Take her which, meant, which, which meant a lot to me, by the yeah, way. Yeah, to all of us. And she is, a, and, and the Washington Post said, Selig's testimony is a necessary addition to baseball history. So that, that's pretty amazing to hear that from the Washington Post. So thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you all. And uh, I don't, you know, there's a lot of storms up there. So if Megan doesn't pop back on, that just means um, you all are good to go. We appreciate it. And uh, thank, thank you. Thank so you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you very much. Enjoy being with all of you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.